Well, are you ready to make a confession of faith tonight? <laughs> Say this with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm here to receive the word of God. Revelation knowledge of your holy word shall flow unhindered into my heart and spirit. And I will receive supernatural understanding. I have authority to act upon the Holy Word of God. I am the redeemed of the Lord, and I dare to say so. In Jesus' name, I have the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God's Word. The eyes of my understanding, they are enlightened to the Word of God tonight. And the word shall set me free. God sent his word and healed me. So I expect healing tonight. Physically, financially, spiritually, in every way. In Jesus' name. I establish it. I decree it. Amen. Praise God. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Now, in the service last night, I made a statement that when you reflect back on what you have ministered on, you think of some things that you feel like you kind of left some loose ends. And I made a statement that kept coming to me today, and that's where I want to hook up here in this service. I made this statement that God will allow anything that you will allow on the earth. Now I want to comment on that some. Open your Bible to Hebrews, the second chapter, while you're turning there. The reason I made that statement was because of so many people that misunderstand the things that happen to them in life. They say, well, why did God allow this to happen? Why did God allow that to happen to me? Why me, Lord? Why me? Have you ever said that? Now, I'll not ask for a show of hands, <laughs> but all of us have said it. In times past, anyway. But you see, it wasn't that God put that on you or allowed that to come to you. See, when we say God allowed it, what do we really mean? See, now I know sometimes people mean, well, God didn't do anything to stop it. And God could have stopped it because God is sovereign. And when God didn't do anything to stop it, then God allowed it. But now let's investigate that thought for just a minute. You know, you need to check up on yourself sometimes. And the best way I know to check up on the Word of God in this light is to go back to Genesis 1 and the things that we taught. You know, remember that God said to Adam, don't eat of the tree of blessing and calamity, or the Amplified says blessing and calamity. The King James says good and evil. Don't eat of that tree. It was in the garden. He could eat of all the other trees, but don't eat of that one. For the day you eat thereof, you'll surely die. But we know that Adam did eat of it. He ate of that tree. Now, someone said, well, you see, God allowed Adam to sin. No, God didn't have anything to do with Adam sinning. Now, you see, if you'll always take these things back to Genesis, it'll help you. God didn't have anything to do with Adam sinning. It couldn't have been the will of God for Adam to sin. Because God said, don't do it. Don't do it, Adam. Now, that's the will of God. But you see, he turned the authority of the earth over to Adam. He could do what he would with it. And he did. He sold the earth lease out to Satan. And Satan became the god of the world system. Now, that's the reason you have the troubles, the problems, the sickness, disease, the wars, and all of the things, the wickedness going on in the earth today is because Adam invited the illegal alien into this planet. And he became Lord over the situation. But thank God Jesus got that authority and turned it back over to us. But we still have to realize that Satan is still what the Apostle Paul called the God of the world system. Now, he's not God over us. He's God of the world system. And he's causing things to happen in this earth through wicked men. 
Now, someone said, now God didn't do anything to stop Adam. So God allowed him to sin. But now wait a minute. Under the arrangement that God had with Adam was that you subdue the earth, have dominion over everything on the earth. The fish of the sea, the fowl there, over the cattle, over all the earth. You have total and complete dominion. Subdue it. That means if it gets out of line, you put it back in line. Don't call me, Adam. I'll call you and see what you did about it. Now, when God said, don't eat of the tree of good and evil, that was all that God could do. He did all he could do to stop Adam from doing it when he said that. Under the covenant that he made with Adam, under the agreement that he made with Adam in this earth lease, that's all that he could do. If he did anything else, he's violated his word. If he comes in there and slaps the apple or the orange or whatever it was out of Adam's hand and says, no, I said don't do it and you're not going to do it, then God would be a liar because he said, I give you dominion. You subdue it. He was to subdue the serpent. He was to take dominion over the serpent, but he didn't do that. Now, God did everything he could under his power to stop this earth from being turned over to an illegal alien. Everything that could be done under that agreement that he made with Adam. Now, that's why I say God will allow anything that you will allow in the earth because it's not up to God to stop you from doing some things. It's not up to God to stop the devil from doing things in the earth. It's up to you, the body of Christ, the believer, the one that has the earthly body that gives you authority on this earth to exercise dominion. And then God anointed you with the Holy Ghost to carry out that dominion. Can you see that? Y'all still out there? Did you go home? <laughs> Let me know once in a while. Well, you see, when you look at it in that light, it helps you, see, to understand that the things that are happening to you is not because God allowed it. Most of the time now, it's because we allowed the devil to deceive us into believing it was God that allowed it. When God didn't have a thing to do with it. There's people that will say, uh, well, you know what the Bible says, all things work together for good. Yeah, the Apostle Paul said that. That wasn't exactly what he said, but I mean, that is recorded in the Bible. See, it's true Paul made that statement, but it was about praying in the Spirit. What you pray about in the Spirit will work together for good. Not everything that happens in the earth works together for good. If that were true, then it worked together for good that Adam sinned. Now, you know that's not true. It wasn't working together for our good because sin came into the earth. So you see, you have to rightly divide the word of truth and realize that some of the statements that are in the Bible, if you take them out of the context, then they become false truths. They're true in the context, but when you come out of that, they're false. And you hear people quoting that from everything, from them breaking legs to committing suicide. Well, you know, the Bible says all things work together for good. The Apostle Paul didn't even believe that. Did you realize that? Did you remember that he wrote to the church, I believe it was the church at Thessalonica, and said, I would have come to you once and again. But you know what the Bible says, all things work together for good. No, that wasn't what he said, was it? No, that wasn't what he said. He said, I would have come to you once and again, but Satan hindered me. Now that's what the Apostle Paul said. But people quote the Apostle Paul as saying, everything that happens in the earth to you is God's will for you and it is working together for good. Fully. <laughs> Just pardon me, but that's about the only way I know to express myself about that. It's trash. <laughs> it's not true if you pull it out of the context. Now, you go back and study that. I don't have time to get into that. That's the 8th chapter of Romans. Start at verse 26 and read on down, and you'll find the context of it. You'll find out the things you pray about in the Spirit will work together for good after you intercede in the Spirit about it. Now, I said all of that to bring you to this and lay a foundation for what we're going to show you in the Scripture tonight and kind of review some things that we've talked about. There's people that say, yes, but now brother so-and-so 
He got both legs broke and was in the hospital for 39 days and 18 people witnessed to him and he got saved. Well, you know, the Bible says all things work together for good. Well, listen, if 19 people had witnessed to him while he was all right, well, he'd have probably got born again without having both legs broke. God didn't break his legs to get him in the hospital so he could get saved. The devil was trying to kill him. And God showed up on the scene through his mercy and grace and got him born again. Hallelujah. Now, in our hometown of England, Arkansas, all 3,000 people, <laughs> there was a friend of mine there that had a little boy. Now, this was several years ago. And, and this little boy was about five years old. Well, every time the fire trucks would, you know, the fire siren would go off and, man, everybody in England starts looking to see where the smoke's coming from, you know. And this little boy, he wanted to go see, wanted to follow that red truck. So they get in their car and they'd follow this red truck. And they'd get there and here's this red truck at this house and it's on fire. Well, he watched it, you know, and, and so this went on for several weeks. And every time the siren would go off, his daddy would get him in the truck, and he'd just love to follow that red truck. So one day he looked at his daddy and he said, Daddy, why is that red truck running all over town setting these houses on fire? <laughs> now laugh, but some of you have been saying the same thing. See, the man got saved because his legs was broken, 19 people witnessed to him. God showed up on the scene and they said, yeah, see there, God broke his leg. No, God showed up on the scene to save the situation. And we got the idea that God did it. Now, see, we call God our Heavenly Father, right? Now, if he broke the fellow's legs, that's child abuse. Hmm? Somebody said, all right, maybe God didn't do it, but he allowed it. Now, what do you mean God allowed it? See, go back to Genesis. Did God allow Adam to sin? No, he did everything he could do under that agreement to stop it from happening. But you see, because we allow some things, it's up to us. Jesus said in the 16th chapter of Matthew, he said to Peter, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. He said, I'll tell you, the secret to the kingdom of God is whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Now, that's a little bit blind to us. I believe the Amplified says it this way. It's probably not exact, but it says, whatever you have authority to bind on earth is what's already bound out of heaven. Now, that'll give you some light. Ask yourself, what's bound out of heaven? Sickness, disease, poverty, any trials or tests up there? No, no sickness, disease up there. Sickness couldn't come from heaven. There's not any there. So if it's bound out of heaven, you have authority to bind it off of your part of the earth. Are you listening? Now, see, we've spent two nights dealing with the authority that God has given us. Now, it's time for us to understand that we need to put it into practice. It's not theory. It's gospel. So when... People see God show up on the scene and see God get glory out of the situation. They end up saying, look what God did. He caused that, he gave that fellow cancer so he could heal him and get glory for it. Now, you know, God's not schizophrenic. God doesn't do things like that. That's not my heavenly father. If God lived on the earth and did one-tenth of the things that most Christians accuse him of doing. Wicked men would put him in the penitentiary for doing those things. You're getting quiet on me. You still out there? I'm doing better preaching you are saying amen. Now, see... I'm operating in one of the fivefold ministries as a teacher. Predominantly, that's the area that God has called me. Now, when I came to town, you see, 
Ephesians 4 says, Apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, for the perfecting of the saints, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So I'm operating that for the perfecting of the saints. And I hear people say, well, God used sickness to perfect the saints. God does this and he does that to perfect you. The trials and tests perfect you and all the troubles perfect you. Well, now, if that were true, then the apostles, prophets, pastors, and teachers ought to be giving you troubles and problems. Because they're to perfect you. So if that were true, what should have happened when I came into town? Should have had posters up all over town, said, Charles Capps coming to operate in one of the fivefold ministries as a teacher. He's going to give some lung cancer, some athlete's foot for the perfecting of the saints, and going to give some car wrecks and some broke legs. Now, you know better than that, don't you? Now, if that would have happened, and the police believed those posters, you know what would have happened? (laughs) When I got out of my plane, they would have carted me into the paddy wagon and put me in jail. They'd have said, man, you don't need to be loose anywhere. (laughs) But yet, Christians accuse my heavenly Father of doing that. And I'm supposed to imitate him. Hmm? Are you still out there? Now, it's all right if we just follow the Holy Ghost, isn't it? <laughs> Have you found Hebrews, the second chapter? Begin with verse 5. For unto the angels has he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visiteth him? Now he's talking about man, and he's talking about the son of man. Don't just get the idea he's talking about Jesus there. He's not just talking about Jesus. He's talking about man, and he's talking about the son of man. Now listen to what he says. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that was not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than angels. Now, one of the statements I made last night. I said that man was created on a higher order than angels. Now, there's people that would argue with that, and I can see why they would from this scripture here. Thou madest him a little lower than angels. But man was created on a higher order than angels. He fell below angels. Now, I'm going to qualify that in just a minute, so don't turn me off. Don't say, well, now, I won't believe that because of what it says here, because I'm going to show you what it said here in another place where they got this from (laughs) and prove to you that what we're saying goes along with the Bible. Man was not created on a lower order than angels. He was created on a higher order. Now, I mentioned this in one of the other services, that angels did not have the right of choice. They had the ability to choose, but they did not have the right to it. Now, you can understand that somebody having, it's like a child. You know, you tell your child, don't she play in the street. Now, he's got an ultimatum. He has the ability to choose whether he's going to obey you or not, but he doesn't have the right to make that choice. You understand what I'm saying? It's wrong for him to disobey you, but he has the ability to make the choice, but he doesn't have the right to do it because you have told him not to do it. Now, God created the angels as created beings. They're designed of God for certain work that God has them to do. They're here to minister for us who are heirs of salvation. They're limited in what they can do. They can't preach the gospel. Have you noticed that? That angels can't preach the gospel? Now they will the last three and a half years of the tribulation. But until the earth lease runs out, they can't. Now, here's the thing that we need to realize. That angels don't have the right that men have. Man was created on a higher order than angel. God sent an angel down to Cornelius' house and said, You go tell Cornelius that we've heard his prayers, and if he'll send and get Simon Peter, he'll come tell him what to do. Why didn't the angel tell him what to do? 
The angel didn't have the right to do it. He couldn't preach the gospel. But I'll tell you, Peter had a flesh, blood, and bone body, and besides that, he was anointed with the Holy Ghost to preach the gospel. So his body gave him the authority to preach, and God gave him the anointing to preach. See, it takes the authority plus the anointing to carry out the work of God in this earth. That's the reason the Holy Ghost can't come in this earth and just destroy the works of the devil. Sure, he has the power to do it. God has the power with just his little finger to just destroy all evil, just the flip of his finger. But if he did, he'd be a liar. He has set his word out in Genesis 1. Let man have dominion over the earth. And as long as this earth lease runs, then man will have dominion, whether it's wicked men or righteous men, because that is God's ultimatum, and it'll be just that way until the lease runs out. So God has the ability to stop all evil in an instant of time. But he can't do it because of his word. God is limited by his word. Can you understand that? See, he's limited by what he has agreed to and what he has established through the eons of time. God has never broken his word and it's impossible for God to lie. So that's the reason you're having all the things going on in the earth today. And that's why people don't understand it. But here he tells you that he gave man dominion. And he says, you don't yet see all things put under man, but you do see them all put under Jesus' feet. Now, just think for a minute, just mentally go through the scriptures where Jesus, when he came to this earth, when he was anointed with the Holy Ghost, stood there and said, the Spirit of the Lord's upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel, recover the sight to the blind, set at liberty them that are bruised. In other words, to destroy the works the devil had done. 1 John 3, 8, the latter part of the verse, I tell you, I love that verse. It says, for this purpose was the Son of God manifested that he might loosen, dissolve, and undo the works the devil had done. Now, that's the amplified version of it. Loosen, dissolve, and undo the works the devil had done. That's what he came to do. The thief came to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus came to undo everything the devil did and set man back in his rightful position, rightful place in this earth to have authority and dominion over evil spirits, principalities, powers, and all that hell would release against us. When Jesus stood and said, I give you the keys of the kingdom, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. He said, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And they won't, because of the anointing of God. See, we have the authority. God furnishes the anointing. Now watch this. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than angels. In other words, Jesus was not operating in his divine Godhead power. He's telling you that Jesus came here as a man. He came here as a man. He took upon himself flesh, the likeness of sinful flesh. Come on on down to verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Now, the word destroy there is a little bit misleading to us. This word literally means paralyze. See, if he destroyed him, as we think of destroy, it would have annihilated him and he wouldn't have been anymore. But it means to paralyze. i tell you this good news there. Do you remember the serpent that Moses put on the pole? The people had been bitten by the snakes because, you know why they were bitten by snakes? They said, we're all going to die in the wilderness. You know what God had told them? God said, I'm going to do exactly what you say in my ear. Or, the, actually, if you render that the way it should have been rendered, he said, I'm going to allow to come on you what you say. In other words, you'll prophesy your own thing. So they said, we're all going to die in the wilderness. And snakes came among them and bit them and they died. 
And see, if you read the King James, it indicates that God did it. Well, now, just wait a minute. Let me show you something about that. Ask yourself, if they had obeyed God, would the snakes bit them? No. If they had have obeyed God, that wouldn't have happened. Then who caused it to happen? They did. Their words. They prophesied it. They called for it. Now, you know, that's dumb. When God says it's going to happen just like you say it, and they said, we're all going to die in the wilderness. <laughs> what are you going to do with a situation like that? Well, see, God got blamed for the whole deal. But then Moses cried out to God, and God said, put a serpent on a pole, a brass serpent. When you get that serpent on the pole, it'll come to pass that whosoever has been bitten are affected by this old serpent. Now, that serpent and those snakes is a type of Satan. There's no doubt about that. Remember when God was talking to Moses, he said, uh, throw your rod down. I mean, that, that was when he was talking to Moses about leading the children of Israel. He threw his rod down and turned into a serpent. And he started running from it. Then God told him to pick it up. But the tail, and he did, it turned back into a rod. Now, when they got there before Pharaoh, Aaron had the rod and he threw it down. Turned into a serpent. Pharaoh said, that's nothing. Bring my magician. So they brought the magicians and they threw their rods down. They turned into serpents too. But you see, the rod that Aaron threw down turned into a king snake. You know what king snakes do? They eat other snakes. And that king snake swallowed all the other serpents. And then when he picked it up by the tail, it turned back into the rod. And the prophet Isaiah said, A rod shall come out of the stem of Jesse. That rod was Jesus. That rod was Jesus. That was a type of Jesus going to the cross and becoming sin for us. He took sin upon himself. He became sin. And while he was there, he swallowed it up. And then he turned back into the rod. Ooh, glory to God. <laughs> now, here's Moses in the wilderness now. And he said, uh, you make your serpent out of brass, and you put him on the pole. Now, it shall come to pass that whosoever has been bitten are affected by these snakes. Now, remember, the snakes represent Satan. If you've been affected by the old serpent, Satan, if they will behold the snake on the pole, they'll live. Now, you know that used to make me so mad. I'd read about that. God, why did you tell Moses to put a snake on the pole? Because I knew that represented Jesus. Why did you put a snake on? Why didn't you put a little lamb on the pole? Because Jesus became sin for us. And you know what brass is symbolic of? Divine judgment. And you know what God was saying? He was saying to the children of Israel, If you will behold what has happened, divine judgment through Jesus' death is going to render the old serpent harmless and paralyze him. And if he has affected you, he won't affect you anymore. Ooh, oh, be God. Hallelujah. Let me ask you something. Now, we're not a snake-believing church, but if we brought a basket full of rattlesnakes in here, we probably wouldn't have many folks to preach to. Probably wouldn't have any preacher here to tell you the truth. I mean, we're not snake handlers. Now, I'm for putting my heel on their head. But what if we brought a brass snake in here? Would anybody be afraid to handle a brass snake? He's paralyzed. Divine judgment has rendered Satan harmless. If you will behold what happened to Satan when Jesus died on the cross, he paralyzed him. Divine judgment. 
is what rendered him powerless. That snake on the pole is not only Jesus, but that serpent on the pole is divine judgment that rendered Satan powerless over the believer. You have dominion over Satan and evil spirits. He gave them dominion over all the earth. Glory be to God. Now, we're back in Hebrews, the second chapter. We don't yet see all these things happen, but we do see Jesus who came here with the body of a man. He walked like a man. He talked like a man. He said, I'm the son of man. And he destroyed the works of the devil. So we saw total and complete dominion through the life of Jesus here on earth over the works of the devil. How did it start? It started in the wilderness when Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights and Satan came there to tempt him to turn the stones into bread. Now notice what happened. You can find this in Luke, the fourth chapter. Jesus said... It is written. Notice the first thing that he says to the devil. It's written. It's already established. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. In other words, Jesus was not going to seek the thing. He was seeking the thing that would produce the thing. The word of God is life. You'll live by every word of God. Now, that being a truth, there's an opposite end to that or what we call a reciprocal of that truth. And that simply is this. If you live by every word of God, you will die by the words of the devil. If you're always quoting the devil, you will die spiritually. You will be defeated financially. You will be defeated physically if you're quoting the words of the devil. But if you're quoting God, there's life in God's words. And if you behold what Jesus has done to Satan, behold what happened to him on the cross. And Satan is rendered harmless by what happened to Jesus. And you have dominion and authority. We don't yet see all these things under us, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than angel. In other words, he had flesh and blood and bone body like us. And he was not above the angels at that point because He came here as a man. You understand that? He came here as a man. And God anointed him with the Holy Ghost healing power. Now, let's go to the scripture that this verse comes from in Psalms 8. Because we're going to unravel a mystery here that's been a little bit of a confusion to a lot of people. I know it was to me for some time. I'd read there where it says that we were created lower than angels. And I couldn't understand that because I knew that angels couldn't do some of the things we did. Well, let's read it in the context of where the writer of the Hebrew was quoting from. Now, the one that says, a one in a certain place was David. That's who he was talking about. Well, let's just read from verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. That one scripture there we could preach a week on it. Listen to what it said. Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength. If you've been born again 15 seconds, if you will learn to get your mouth in motion and quoting God's word, it will still the avenger. Wasn't that what Jesus did? He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And every time Satan came at him, he quoted what God said. The authority of Jesus' faith against the devil and his faith in the word of God absolutely shook Satan's kingdom beyond repair. He spoke three words that shook Satan's kingdom beyond repair. He hadn't been able to get it back together since, and he never will when he said, it is written. But there's too many Christians quoting what the devil said. Now look at it. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon, the stars, which thou ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man? Notice, and the son of man. So man and the son of man. 
that thou visiteth him. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angel, hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. Now, you know, if words mean anything, a third grader wouldn't have any trouble understanding that, would they? All things. All things. Now, connect that with what Genesis 1 said. Let us make man in our image. Let them have dominion over the fish in the sea, the fowl, the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creepeth on the earth. Subdue it and have dominion. Now, that's as simple as you can get it. Now, notice the word angel here, where it says, Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. Now, this word translated angel here in the Hebrew text, which it was translated from, does not mean angel at all. The word that's been translated angel here is Elohim. You know what Elohim means? It's plural for God. For some reason, I suppose... <laughs> afraid they'd be stoned, they didn't translate it that way. He said it made him a little lower than God's. They're afraid they'd get stoned if they did it that way. But that's what it said, actually said. Thou madest him a little lower than God's. Now somebody said, well now, Brother Caps, does anybody else in the whole world believe it that way? Are you the only one that ever believed it that way? Well, there was a certain rabbi that believed it that way. Rabbi Jesus. <laughs> Turn with me to John, the 10th chapter. John chapter 10, verse 30. Jesus is speaking. He said, I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of these works do ye stone me? And the Jews answered him, saying, For good works we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. <laughs> I just have to laugh every time I read that. Because I've had people to say to me, Well now, Brother Caps, you must thank your God. Going around quoting the Scriptures. Blessed coming in, blessed going out, blessed in the basket, in the store. My God meets my need according to his riches and glory. I have abundance and no lack. How do you know that? You must thank your God. No. I'm just quoting what God said about it. Paul said in Ephesians 5, 1, said, Be imitators of God as dear children. Now, the Greek says it that way. The King James says, be ye followers, which the word follow is the same Greek word that we get our word imitate or mimic from. So he actually said mimic God. Now, when you do in most churches, you won't be very popular because they think you're trying to be God. And people will say, well, you're just trying to act like God. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's a compliment. <laughs> no, no, I'm not trying to act like I am God. I'm trying to act as God would act in this situation. If I have lack, then I'm going to do like God did when he saw darkness. When he saw darkness, he said, light. So when I see lack, I say abundance. And start quoting the scripture. Just like Jesus did to the devil. I'll live by every word of God. But I'll die by the words of the devil. Or I'll be defeated by the words of the devil. It's amazing to me how many Christians are always saying, you know what the devil said to me? They tell you everything the devil said. And you ask them, what did God say? I don't know. I don't ever hear God. <laughs> no wonder. You're too busy listening to the devil. I mean, you can't listen to both of them at once. If you get to listen to the devil, you won't believe what God said. You get to listening to God, you won't believe what the devil said. <laughs> so when people say to me, well, now you're just trying to act like God. Okay, let's look at this logically now. If I'm saying what God said in his word, and you say I'm acting like God, then what if you were saying what the devil said? Who would you be acting like? 
slipped that one in on you, didn't I? If I'm acting like God saying what God said, you're acting like the devil when you're saying what the devil said. And you're releasing the negative faith in that thing. See, faith in God brings God on the scene. Faith in his word brings God on the scene. Fear, which is an opposite of faith, fear brings the devil on the scene. Your words either give God authority to operate on it or the devil to operate on your words. You're the one that decrees a thing, and God will add his word to it and his faith and power to it to see that it comes to pass. But if you quote what the devil said, the devil will add his to it to see that it comes to pass. And he'll harass you. I'll never forget what the Lord said to me. In 1974, I was right here in Dallas, Texas, in the Holiday Inn. I was in a full gospel businessman's meeting. Praying in the Spirit, and the Spirit of God came on me and began to say some things to me. He said, just as there is creative power in all of my word to come forth as you speak it and release creative power today, it's just as powerful as it was when I spoke it, he said. It's not lost one bit of its power, but it's just as powerful if you'll speak it today and speak it forth to cause faith to come. Even so is there evil power present in the words of the enemy to afflict and oppress everyone that speaks them. See, you're releasing evil power when you speak the words of the devil. You're releasing the power of God when you speak the word of God. See, the authority of your faith released either in the devil or in God, has preeminence in the earth. Whatever you bind will be bound. Whatever you loose will be loosed. You can loose the devil or you can bind the devil and loose God on your behalf. But you see, because people haven't understood their authority, they thought we were being blasphemous when we started doing these things. Why? You must think you're God. No, I don't think I'm God. One guy said, you must think you're divine. I said, no, but I'm a joint heir with Jesus. You figure it out. <laughs> what he gets, I get. <laughs> Glory to God. All right, back to John, the 10th chapter. Jesus said, I and my father are one. Now, they're going to stone him because he's a mere man and he's made himself God. See, that people haven't changed. They're still the same today. If you're going to walk with God, you're going to have to get to where you don't care what people say. Because I'll tell you, I've been on both sides of the fence. I quoted the devil for 30 years. I got so poor I couldn't pay attention to quoting him. <laughs> I'll tell you, if you'll quote God, it'll change your life. Now, notice what happens here. Listen to what Jesus said in verse 34. Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods? Now, what are you going to do with that? Now, every time somebody accuses you acting like God, say, yeah, thank you. That's what Jesus said. <laughs> now, notice that's a little G. No, we're not God, but he's talking about God over the situation. Now, remember, John said, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. All things were made by the Word. Without the Word was not anything made that was made, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Now, if the Word was with God, the Word was God, and God changeth not, then the Word is still God over every situation, every circumstance of life today. Isn't that right? Either that's right or I misunderstood what Word said. But that's exactly right. This certain rabbi named Jesus said, it is written in your law, I said ye are gods. Now see, religion has steered away from that. And certainly you could go too far with that. And you have to say some things to keep people from running off with that and trying to be God. No, we're not trying to be God. I'm not trying to teach you to be God. We're trying to teach you to imitate God's methods. And when God saw darkness, he said, light. So when you see trouble, say peace. When you see lack, say abundance, and quote the scripture for it, see. Now look at what happened. 
If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, Thou blasphemest because I said I am the Son of God? If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though ye believe me not, believe the works that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. All right, what was Jesus quote? He was quoting the Word of God. He was quoting God's Word. He said, ye are gods. Now notice what he said. Verse 35. If he called them gods unto whom the Word of God came. Now notice. Whoever the Word of God came to is the ones that he called gods. Elohim. Now, spell with a little g. Understand that. We're subordinate unto God. We're talking about rulers. We're talking about rulers over situations and over the earth. Now remember the scripture that we quoted in one of the other sessions? The heavens, even the heavens of the Lord, but the earth hath he given to the children of men. It's up to us to subdue it. We're to be gods over the situations in the earth. If the devil's going to be destroyed and his work's destroyed in the earth, you are the only body that Jesus has in the earth today. He has no other body in the earth except the church. It's the only body that he has. His physical body is seated at the right hand of the Father, and it's going to stay right there until we get Satan underfoot. Now, go with me to Psalms 82, and I'll show you what Jesus would quote. See, it makes a difference when you understand why these faith folks do some of the things they do and say. See, there's some of you, many of you watching by satellite, have thought, I don't understand them folks. How in the world can they say that? How can they say all these things? I've had people to say to me, see, I quote the scriptures over my body daily. I'm the body of Christ. The enemy have no power over me. Overcome evil with good. Every disease, germ, every virus touches this body, dies instantly. I forbid sickness or disease in this body. I don't deny it. If I'm sick, I just forbid it to operate in this body. If I get sick, I missed it. And if I missed it, then I better do something about it. <laughs> now, they say, how in the world can you say every disease, germ, every virus touches your body, dies instantly? What do you base that on? I base it on Mark eleven twenty three. Whosoever shall say, believe, doubt not in his heart, believe what he says will come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. If he saith it long enough to get to believeth in it. <laughs> but the problem is most people don't believe it when they say it. And they won't say it long enough to believe it. But faith will come if you say it. It takes weeks and months, sometimes years, to build this into your spirit. They say, well, how in the world can you say that? It's easy. Just listen. Every disease germ, every virus that touches my body dies instantly. Somebody said, yeah, but what happens if you get sick? I did. Well, it didn't work, did it? Yeah, it's working. Faith is coming. What did you do? Got some medicine, got over it, and kept saying it. Kept saying it. Kept saying it. Kept saying it. Somebody said, well, why would you take medicine? I missed it. When you miss it, get you something and get well and find out where you missed it. If you're not careful, some of you die before you find out where you missed it. Now, <laughs> I told you we was just going to follow the Holy Ghost. Somebody needed that. If it's a life or death situation and you've missed it, you ought to get medical help. Amen. You ought to get medical help if they can help you. Don't get under condemnation over that. There's been too much of this. Somebody said, well, I'm just going to trust God. Well, if you don't know where you've missed it, you may die before you find out where you missed it if it's a life or death situation. Somebody needed that. Now listen to what Jesus said. Psalms 82. I mean what God said. <laughs> Psalms 82. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. Notice. Gods. Plural. And you know what that word that's translated gods? It's Elohim. It's the very same word translated angel over there in Psalms 8. And then from Psalms 8 it's translated angel in the New Testament. The word is Elohim. It's plural for God. 
In fact, there's three words in this very verse that is the same word. It reads this way. Elohim standeth in the congregation of the Elohim. He judgeth among the Elohim. <laughs> and they wouldn't even translate it that way for fear of getting stoned. Man, we're going to say there's all these gods and we're going to get stoned sure as the world because there's only one God, so we, we just going to change that up. God stands in the congregation of the Elohim and he judgeth among the Elohim. Somebody said, oh, I know, Brother Caps, what that means. It's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Well, now that sounds good till you read verse 2. How long will you judge unjustly and accept the person of the wicked? Now, which one are you accusing of judging unjustly? The Father, the Son, or the Holy Ghost? <laughs> Tricked you there, didn't I? Defend the poor, the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rip them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. Now here's the key to understanding why things are in the earth like they are today. Now I said last night, and I know it shocks some of you, that if God has everything under control, he's really got it in a mess. But you see, God doesn't have everything in this earth under control at this point. He has an overall control. He's prophesied from the beginning what the end will be, and it will turn out that way. But in the interim time, it's up to us to see that we operate in the anointing of God to subdue this earth and the wickedness in it. So here he says all the foundations of the earth are out of course. It's not going the way he intended for it to go. It is the will of God that it be on earth as it is in heaven. Well, I'd like to preach that, but I better stay with this. Look, verse 6. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you the children of the Most High. Now, is there any doubt who he's talking about? He's talking about the children of God are gods. G-O-D-S. Elohim. Over the situations of life, over the circumstances of life, you shouldn't be bowled over by the circumstances of life. You should triumph victoriously. Now, don't take what I said and go tell, Brother Cap said we ought not ever have any troubles or problems or trials in life. I didn't say that. The only people I've ever heard say that was the people that said that we said that. But we didn't say that. <laughs> it was the people that accused us of saying that that said that. <laughs> I don't know whether you got that or not, but... No, you're going to have troubles in life. You're going to have problems in life. You're going to face temptation, test, and trial in life. But it's not God testing, tempting, and trying you. It's the devil trying to put you under. And if you don't believe that, read Mark, the fourth chapter. Jesus tells you five things that Satan uses to get the word out of you. Affliction, persecution, deceitfulness of riches, lust of other things. And he tells you that these things come to steal the word from you. Not to make you strong. There's always somebody that says, yeah, but you see, Brother Caps, God led the children of Israel through the wilderness. And God leads us through the wilderness sometimes to make us stronger. Let me ask you something. Did you check up on the wilderness experience? Did you notice that the wilderness experience killed the children of Israel, didn't make them strong? The wilderness experience was a curse, not a blessing. You know what caused the wilderness experience? Their disobedience. So we need to come off of that. Get back on the Word of God now. He said, ye are gods. Well, does anybody else in the New Testament agree with that? Well, the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 5.17. You ought to turn to that. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. You missed a good place to shout. Amen. And you know what the Amplified says? You shall reign as kings in life by one Jesus Christ. You know who Jesus Christ was? The Word of God. 
You will reign in life by the word of God. Go ahead and clap for Jesus. Praise God. But you will be defeated in life by the words of the devil if you quote and speak the words of the devil. God wants you to be victorious. God wants you to live above the circumstances of life. Sure, you'll be stronger if you go through a test and trial and act on the Word of God and exercise your faith and win out over the devil and you'll come out of it stronger. But it wasn't the trial that made you stronger. It wasn't the problem that made you stronger. It was acting on God's Word and being obedient to God that made you stronger. And then, see, you saw God on the scene and thought God did it. Like the little boy saw the red fire truck and thought, what's this truck going around over town setting all these houses on fire? No, the truck was trying to put them out. And that's what God's trying to do, put out the fires. And some people get the wrong idea about it. So God has established in his word that man was created on a higher order than angels. There's no doubt about it. Jesus said, you're gods. Spell with a little g. Now, I'm going to say this again. Don't anyone, if you go out of these churches, say that Brother Cap said, we are God. I didn't say that. I said, we are gods. Spell with a little g. Gods over the situation of life, the circumstances of life, with the Word of God. Not in yourself. None of this is in yourself. This is through the Word of God, just exactly like Paul said. You'll reign as kings in life by Jesus Christ or by the Word of God. Just like he told the devil. You just tell the devil the same thing that Jesus told him. I will not live by bread alone. I will not live by obtaining things. I will live by every Word of God. You know why you'll live by the Word of God? Because Jesus said in John the 6th chapter, verse 63, He said, The words I speak unto you, their spirit, their life. Let there be light. (laughs) Jesus said, The words I speak, their spirit and their life. Now, what's He saying? He said, My words have spirit life. I am speaking spirit life. How did he have such great faith? He said, I speak all of that which I hear my father say. You know how faith comes? Faith cometh by hearing the word of God. So when a man or Jesus or anybody else speaks only what God says, your faith is going to grow exceedingly. But you see, you'll get criticized for it. And some people won't associate with you because they think you're trying to be God. And some will accuse you of trying to act divine (laughs) when you're just trying to imitate the Father God. If you quote God's Word, the faith will get inside you. Did you know that the energy of God is released in His Word? I don't have but just a minute or two, but I want to share this with you. Faith cometh by hearing the Word of God. Now, that faith, is the faith of God. It's in His Word. If it wasn't in His Word, you couldn't get any faith by hearing His Word. But when you hear His Word, that faith will get inside you. Little by little, it'll get inside you. Remember I said, when I started saying, every disease, germ, every virus touches my body, dies instantly? The first thing that happened, I got sick. So I said, not working, is it? Yeah, faith is coming. So I kept saying it, kept saying it, kept saying it. Over weeks and months, over a three-month period of time, ulcers left my body. They disappeared. You know why? The divine energy of God in His Word got inside me and nullified the sickness and disease. Oh, I didn't deny that I was sick. I just denied it the right to exist there. You see the difference there. So it's God's Word that releases the divine energy of God. And when you act in faith on the Word of God, you're putting God's personality to work for you. Faith is really God's personality. It is His personality. He is a God of faith. And when you act in faith, 
with the authority of your faith, then that is God's personality and manifestation through you. And I believe that's the very reason that Jesus said, and God wrote and said, ye are God's. Through the word of God, see. Not through any of your own ability. It's through God's word. And Paul says, they that receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. Abundance of grace. Grace is God's willingness to use his power and his ability on your behalf, even though you don't deserve it. Now, that's what grace is. And he said, they that receive the abundance of grace. There's some people that won't receive God's willingness. God's willing for you to be saved. God's willing for you to be healed. God is willing that you be prosperous. But some people won't receive that willingness. But if you'll receive the abundance of God's willingness, abundance of grace, and the gift of righteousness, then he says you will reign in life by one Jesus Christ or by the word of God. Oh, hallelujah. Stand up on your feet and praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We're out of time.